Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Byron Community Church. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, we had a great time last Saturday at our family dance party. Thank you to Eric Traplin for putting that together for us. And something very exciting happened during that dance party. Sarah and I welcomed our baby daughter, Noel. She had to come in time for the bubble song, I guess. We want to thank you all for the flowers and the lovely cards and the prayers. We really do appreciate it. But see, anything can happen during these online events. And coming up this month, Saturday, March 27th, live at 10 a.m. right here on YouTube, Sunday School at Home presents a Star Wars special. You will not want to miss that one. And now, over to Pastor John for his sermon this morning, Stand Up to Bullies, Stand Up for What We Believe, Citizenship 101. Over to John. Sometimes we'd rather sit than stand. We'd prefer to be sitting down than standing up. S-R-O. Several years ago, during a March break, now this was uh, years ago before the pandemic, back when teachers and students used to get a March break. Sorry, Heather. But years ago, my family, my teacher wife, Heather, our two children who are younger than Melissa and Mark and me, spent a few days in Toronto. And we decided last minute to go to a Toronto Raptors basketball game. Now, again, this was before the pandemic when the Toronto Raptors actually played a few games in Toronto. Um, Because it was a last minute decision, we went to the booth to get what are called walk-up tickets. And we were informed that the game was completely sold out. We were very disappointed, but fortunately, a gentleman overheard our interaction. He was a kind, polite scalper. And he offered us tickets, four tickets, but with a 30% markup on the uh, original price of a ticket. He assured us that they were really good tickets, center court, but high enough up that you could see the whole basketball floor. Reluctantly, I agreed to buy the tickets. Uh, The game was sold out. I didn't think I had another option. Now, it was a couple of hours before the game, We had time to go out for a bite to eat and then return to the arena, and I took a careful look at the tickets. I noticed that the uh, area in the arena was listed, the section number was there, but instead of uh, seat numbers, there were the letters S-R-O. And then I figured it out. It uh, meant uh, seats, random option. In other words, these were the classic first-come, first-served seats. We were going to be sitting in a special section that were uh, rush tickets. So I told the family, we got to get back early enough that we can get the best selection of seats in our section. So an hour before the game, we arrived. We uh, got to that center court area. We started to climb up the steps up and up and up looking for the number of our section can you believe our section was right up at the top of the arena yes the scalper was right you could see the whole basketball court with binoculars but uh, anyways there were a lot of seats available in our section and as we were deciding where to sit an usherette came over and asked if she could help us she said can I see your tickets to see where you're seated. And I thought, that's unusual. These are rush tickets. We can sit wherever. And then she announced, as she looked at our tickets, in a very loud voice so that I could hear, the family could hear, everybody in the section, I think everybody in the arena. She said, oh, these are SRO tickets. Standing room only, SRO, and you guessed it. We watched that game standing up right at the top of the arena. 
it was a very expensive. It was, my feet are killing me. No fun kind of evening. But I did learn something. SRO does not stand for Seats Random Option. It stands for, kind of ironic, it stands for Standing Room Only. And also in our case, there was a secondary meeting, meaning. Um, in our experience, it was SRO. It was a scalper ripoff kind of experience. Yes, sometimes we would rather be sitting down than standing up. You know what it's like. You've been in a long lineup for what seems like hours. You just are wanting desperately to, to sit down. Or you're on a crowded subway train in a big city. There are no seats available, so you have to stand up. And the uh, subway train is stopping and starting, stopping and starting. You're being jolted all over the place, and people are jostling you. You're trying to stand firm. You're... Uh, grabbing for a pole to help you stand firm and you hope you've grabbed a pole and not a stranger's arm and uh, you're doing your best to stand stable, to stand tall and not fall. Or there's other situations, right, where you'd rather sit than stand. Uh, this weekend, I get to uh, perform an infant dedication service. Uh, it's Anu, many of you remember Anu, her husband Ryan, and their little baby Ella May. And uh, they're in eastern Ontario. Of course, I'm here in London. So this will be my very first Zoom infant dedication service. And I have to admit, I get nervous during an infant dedication service because as some of you know, I have a, a bit of a problem with uh, uh, balance and stability. And I get, I get a bit uptight when I'm holding that little baby, scared I'm going to drop him or her. And uh, so you'll notice that I always keep my eyes open when I do the infant dedication prayer. But this weekend, I'll be able to do the infant dedication prayer with my eyes wide open. Yeah, it's true. Sometimes we would rather uh, sit than stand. But there are other times when it is better by far to stand than to sit. Think of uh, that long car trip, and you just are anxious. You can't wait to stand and stretch. Or when you are asked to stand in recognition of uh, outstanding accomplishment or achievement, and you stand tall and proud. Or during this pandemic, we have been warned about our sedentary lifestyles. We're sitting too much. We need to stand up and get going. Um, in fact, you've heard it said that uh, sitting has now become the new smoking. Uh, it's dangerous for our health. In fact, some of you may need to stand up as you listen to the rest of this sermon. A very healthy choice. Uh, but it's true that there are times we would be better off uh, standing up than sitting down. And you know, when it comes to standing up, uh, it's not only a physical reality or a position of our body but it's also a metaphor. We, we think of someone who uh, is a stand-up guy, who stands tall. It refers to someone with uh, good character and integrity. Or we think in another way of standing up for a, a cause, uh, taking a stand for a, a person or a cause or, or something that really matters. Uh, last week, I had a visit to the uh, hair salon, uh, much more elegant sounding than the barber shop. 
So I was at the hair salon and I wrestled with the question, should I stay or should I go at the end of my haircut? I know that was the title of last week's sermon, but in this case, there were four women in the salon and me. Two were staff, two were customers, and me. The My hairstylist, and notice I have a hairstylist with my fancy head of hair, um, she knows me quite well, knows that I'm a pastor, and she asked about the church, how things are going, when are we going to reopen to in-person services, and uh, the other women, staff and customers, you could tell they were curious. They were watching us. They were listening in. And uh, just before my haircut finished, some of them joined the conversation, but it quickly turned in a, a political direction. And part of me is thinking, no, I just need to get up and get going. But I realized there were many spiritual implications to what was being discussed. And I decided then and there that I needed to stand up and speak out. And for 10 minutes, uh, I engaged in the conversation, and the women were very positive and very receptive to what I had to say. In fact, I said as I was leaving, uh, regardless of when uh, churches are going to reopen to in-person services, I said, ladies, we've had a church service right here today in this hair salon. They chuckled, but they agreed with me. It was a very positive affirmation. It was worth standing up and speaking out. But you know, sometimes the response is very different. Uh, when we stand up, speak out, uh, the reaction is more hostile, uh, more against us. Uh, there could be ridicule or mockery, uh, people not liking what we have to say. And that can be uh, intimidating. You can feel marginalized. You could feel um, minimalized. You can feel like you're the target of intolerance, uh, feeling intimidated, scared silly in that kind of situation. It's like being asked to pray at a family reunion uh, with your extended family. And you know there's some people there who just aren't really thrilled that there's going to be a prayer at the meal uh, because it's such a diverse group of people. They would prefer that uh, a prayer not be given. And, and you're kind of uh, in that spot where you're giving the prayer. And not only that, are you going to pray in Jesus' name? Like, what are you going to do in that kind of setting? Or you walk into the lunchroom and there are a few people gathered there and two or three of them are talking about abortion. And then they're very quick to add, isn't disgusting, isn't it disgusting how these Christians can't mind their own business when it comes to private matters? Hey, they know you're a Christian. What are you going to do? Are you going to stand up and speak out or you're going to just sit down and, and be silent? Or you're talking to your neighbor. And the neighbor uh, declares, always lead to God. Whatever a person believes is true is true for that person. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay silent? Or are you going to stand up and speak out? Are you going to say, well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hey, there's high risk with that approach. And in fact, the reaction might be painful to you. That brings us to our title this morning. <clears throat> the title is <clears throat> as we pause for a fact, stand up to boys, stand up for what you believe. Citizenship 101. And I could have had a longer title because we're going to be thinking about standing firm, standing together, 
uh, striving together, uh, all under this banner of standing up. And I want us to look at what we're to stand up for, or who we're to stand up for, and how do we maintain that stand. And then I also want us to look at uh, who do we stand up to? Uh, who are those adversaries who are against us? When we are to stand tall, what about those who would like us to fall? So this morning we're going to be looking at a, a variety of issues. We're going to be thinking about this notion of citizenship. Where does that fit in? Um, we're going to talk about standing together, unity. We're going to talk about being unified towards a goal, striving to it. We're going to be looking at this idea of standing up to bullies and the role that signs and suffering have to play in taking that kind of stand. So if you've got your Bible, I'd like you to turn to Philippians 1, and we're going to look at the final section in Philippians chapter 1. We finally got there, but we're in Philippians 1 today looking at verse 27 to verse 30. Now you need to know that once again, Paul is going to pivot. I love that. I've used that word pivot now two weeks in a row. But he's moved from a description of his situation. Now he will intentionally uh, look at a prescription. He will give the Philippians some guidance and some instruction. In fact, some have called this uh, a battle strategy that he's giving to the Philippians. Uh, it's interesting how he has addressed Philippians in chapter 1. He began with addressing them as the saints. He's looked at them as servants. And now it's like he sees them as soldiers. Here's the battle plan. Here's the strategy. Here are some instructions. And very definitely in uh, Philippians 1, 27 to 30, we see a number of imperatives. So let's read it. Philippians 1, verse 27. And I'm going to stop just before the end of verse 27. Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm. Now, the first point that we see and what I'd like to make out of this part of what is actually one long sentence in the Greek from verse 27 to the end of verse 30 Fortunately, in English, we've got it divided up a bit. But in this section, what I want us to look at is the importance of standing up for the truth, for the gospel, for Jesus. How? By being good, heavenly citizens. Now, you may be asking, John, where do you get citizenship out of what we just read. Well, the literal Greek would suggest to us a better translation in verse 27 is we're to live in a manner worthy as citizens of heaven. We are to live worthy of our citizenship. The, the Greek word that gets translated conduct yourselves is a, a word uh, that means uh, it, it's from the Greek word uh, polystimai, which, which actually means politics or gets translated citizenship. So it really means here, uh, conduct yourself as good citizens. And Paul in Philippians 3 will tell us how we are citizens of heaven. Now this is very interesting. The people at Philippi, that colony, about 800 miles away from the capital city of Rome, um, were Roman citizens. Uh, years before Paul wrote to the Philippians, um, there was a battle, more like a civil war, between 
the Caesar of uh, the Roman Empire and two of his generals. And the people of Philippi supported Caesar in that winning battle. And as a result, uh, Caesar confirmed upon the residents of Philippi citizenship. And, and with that came all the perks and privileges of citizenship, uh, with responsibilities as well. But the customs, the language, the protection, uh, all of this were, uh, were, were realities for the, uh, the residents of Philippi. But, but Paul has something else in mind. As Christ followers... Christians have dual citizenship. They have a greater citizenship, a citizenship in heaven. They are God's ambassadors, uh, God's heavenly ambassadors here on earth. And they have a greater allegiance, a greater loyalty. Yes, they have a civil responsibility to Caesar, but they have a greater allegiance and a loyalty to Jesus Christ because they are, as it says at the end of the phrase, uh, about the gospel of Christ, they are partakers in that gospel, recipients of it, and they are partners in the gospel, as Paul said earlier in Philippians 1. Uh, they are spreading the gospel. They are sharing the gospel uh, to others. So they are citizens of heaven. And then you'll notice that they are to live in a worthy way. That's a word that Paul uses a lot. Often it's not uh, defined. What do we mean by worthy? Well, it comes from a Greek word which means to balance the scales. And so I see in that word the idea of balance and consistency in one's character in one's integrity. It, it, it really implies what it is to be worthy. It's why I use that phrase that we're called to stand straight and tall, to be, be a man or a woman who stands for what matters, but especially when it comes to personal character and integrity and consistency. Not to be hypocritical, not to be out of balance, not to stand morally crooked uh, or to be all slouched over, but to stand tall and firm in our uh, personal uh, integrity. So Paul is after these Philippians and you and me to live out our citizenship in this kind of worthy manner as good ambassadors, as good representatives of the King of uh, heaven, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ and his, his gospel. This will mean that we are to be people of love. We'll be known for our love, that we're to be people of forgiveness, that we're to be marked by our hope and our holiness, and of course, as appropriate to this series, by our irresistible joy. So stand up. Um, for the truth, for Jesus, for the gospel. And we do that by living out our citizenship in a good and worthy manner. I've been thinking a lot about citizenship and the idea of standing up. Uh, I love it when, for example, in the Olympics, I know there's some question whether there'll be the Olympics this summer, but I love it when a Canadian wins a medal and is standing up on the podium. Now, I know there's controversy these days about standing up for national anthems. We're not going to get uh, political about that, but doesn't it give you a sense of pride when you see that athlete standing up? You don't want to see them slouched over. You don't want to see them kind of uh, uh, sloppy about it. You want to see them standing up tall and proud for Canada, just as we stand that way during uh, our national anthem. I think of that in terms of what it means to stand up as citizens of heaven, tall and proud, living lives of balance and consistency, 
where what we believe is matched by how we behave, where our confession of Christ is matched by our conduct, where there's that kind of uh, consistency, that kind of, of balance. And when I think of citizenship, I think of the few times I've been out of country. And I have a suitcase and I've got a luggage tag that uh, has the Canadian flag and a beaver. What a combination, eh? How Canadian can you get? The Canadian flag and a beaver. The maple leaf and a beaver. Well, when I go elsewhere, I'm not ashamed of that luggage tag. Uh, in fact, I'm quite proud of it. Um, I'm glad that Canada has a good reputation worldwide, that we're not known as uh, some countries uh, are known for having obnoxious, rude people, but we're kind of seen as kind and gentle. And I do my best to, 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 to live in that kind of way, to stand tall and proud uh, as a Canadian. We, as Christ followers, are citizens of heaven. Are you a good representative? Are you a good ambassador of heaven? Is there coordination between what you are telling people and what you are showing people? Are you willing to stand up and to speak out for the gospel of, of Jesus Christ? Paul says in this phrase, he says, uh, whether I am able to see you or whether I just hear about you, I want to know that you are living out your heavenly citizenship in a very positive, very consistent manner. Is that true of you? May that be a challenge even for us today. Now Paul goes on, and I'm going to pick up again at the start of verse 27 and then just get our next idea here. So whatever happens, conduct yourselves as heavenly citizens in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Here we're called to stand up for the faith of the gospel. And the essence of the faith of the gospel is the person and work of Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. How? We are to stand together and we are to strive together for the purposes and sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. This notion of uh, unity. Now, interesting, Paul talks about the one spirit. I've got a footnote, as some of you will have, and it uh, asks the question whether spirit should be capitalized or should it be like the, the spirit of community, something that is very uh, human-oriented. Uh, I lean towards the idea that Paul is referring to the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who generates unity through our uh, mutual conversion. When you become a believer, when I become a believer, we share in the one spirit. Uh, Paul picks up on this in Ephesians. In Ephesians uh, chapter 4. Let me just read the first three verses. And you'll see some uh, parallels. Where he writes, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then here's the phrase. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Holy Spirit through the bond of peace. So Paul here is referring to the person of the Holy Spirit, and I believe in Philippians, uh, this is the idea that Paul has, and he will carry that through, as we'll see next week into chapter 2. Uh, I love the words of Ecclesiastes. Maybe Paul was familiar with what Solomon said about the importance of togetherness, standing together together, if, if one falls, the other is there to pick him or her up. It's the, it's the idea of standing firm. It's the idea of stability, and we can stand better together. Now, the, the word for striving together is, is fascinating. We've already seen a Greek word that means 
politics or citizenship in uh, the start of verse 27, here at the end of verse 27, we have a word uh, that uh, is synotheo, which which we have taken in English to mean athletics. Interesting. So Paul's a good guy. He's interested in politics and he's interested in sports. And uh, for Paul, it's the idea of striving together as a team. And I think what Paul is saying here is that we, we're to stand firm, standing together. We, we are a team striving towards a goal. This idea of teamwork. Uh, we saw it in Nehemiah at the end of 2020, and we see it here in Philippians chapter 1. The importance of working or striving together as a team. Our son Mark is in medical school right now, but uh, in his spare time, uh, he is uh, with a, a football friend um, currently leading a lineman camp. Mark works with the defensive lineman. The other fellow works with the offensive lineman. And if you think of football and you've got that offensive line, to me that's just a, a wonderful portrait of togetherness. They are standing side by side. Their, their, their role is to mutually together protect the quarterback, to, to help the offensive team move that football towards the goal line. And Paul had this kind of teamwork idea in mind. You, you've heard it said in sports where well, that, that, that particular team, their, their individuals are very talented, but, but they're not playing together as a team. And this was a real concern for Paul, concerned enough that as he picks this up in, at the end of chapter 1, we'll see next week he's all over this into chapter 2. Really, Paul here is talking about the importance of unity. If, if we're going to stand firm, especially in face of opposition that Paul is going to talk about, then we have to be able to stand together. Unity is good, it's pleasant, and it's very necessary. Isn't it unfortunate when, instead of standing up in the face of opposition from out there, um, opposition is coming from within? Instead of standing firm, we are tearing each other apart or tearing each other down. We need to have that conviction to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And notice the goal. Uh, Paul says, striving together as one, so like as we're just like a one collective person for the faith of the gospel. Now, unity is not uniformity, it's harmony, but it has a very distinct goal. It's the essentials. A, we can have differences when it comes to preferences or when it comes to methodology, but, but our message is what we have in common. We have the person of the Holy Spirit in common. We have the Lordship of Christ in common. And what we're fighting for, what we're striving for, our goal is what Paul describes as the faith of the gospel. It's, a, it's an unusual phrase. He doesn't use that phrase elsewhere. But I think it really means not faith in the gospel, but, but that faith, that set of beliefs that make up the substance of the gospel. It's why we need to be united in the essentials. In non-essentials, there's a lot of liberty and freedom, but in the essentials, when it comes to the person and work of Christ, we need to experience that kind of unity. Why? Why is this so critical and so important? Well, look at Paul's transition, and we'll read from 28 to the end of the chapter. So I'll pick it up again at the middle of verse 27, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So, so we're to stand for the truth, to stand for the gospel. We're to stand up for Jesus. And, and we can do that as we stand together, as we 
strive together for that lofty goal of the gospel of Christ. But need to keep in mind that we're stand, that we are to stand up to bullies, those who oppose us. For those who, when we're trying to stand tall, they want to see us fall. This idea of standing firm in the face of opposition, our adversaries, those who want to bully us, standing up to bullies. Now, who were the bullies in Philippians 1? There's a lot of uncertainty. Are these the same people that Paul will refer to later in Philippians chapter 3? There's a possibility. Um, we, we really don't know, but, but they knew, and Paul assumed they knew. And I think because there's that ambiguity, uh, we can fit in all kinds of uh, possibilities when it comes to those who might try to uh, intim intimidate us. In fact, the word not being frightened actually means don't be spooked by. You know how horses can be spooked? Well, don't be spooked by. Don't be intimidated by. Uh, don't sit down and shut up. Be willing to stand up and speak out even in the face of some of these people who might make life difficult for you. It reminds me of, do you remember those uh, inflatable toys? Often it would be maybe like a clown or a character from a cartoon, and, and you'd hit that inflatable toy, but it would bounce right back up. You could hit it again, down fly, but it'd bounce right back up. And I think that's the idea here, that uh, even though there may be those who are trying to knock you down, Stand up, stand back up, and stand with courage and boldness. Paul earlier in Philippians 1 gave us his secret. Uh, it had to do back in chapter 1 with the uh, prayers of the saints and the provision of the Spirit. And we have those same resources that enable us to stand in a bold and courageous way. But Paul also talks about the role of signs and the role of suffering. The role of signs, or what may be better translated, omens, is very intriguing. Did you notice how Paul says that when we stand bold and courageously in the face of opposition, we stand up to bullies, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think what we see here is... Uh, this disturbing impression that's given to those who are, are, are out to uh, oppose us, those who are out to intimidate or bully us. And when they see our courage and our boldness, it's a sign to them, it's a message to them, and uh, one that we hope would lead from being disturbed about being destroyed in their fate to conviction, to conversion. I think back to high school. Back then, we shared lockers. I, I can't believe that's what was done, and maybe it's still done today, but I shared my locker with a guy named Paul. But the only thing we had in common was we shared a locker. Uh, I think we were assigned the locker, uh, partnered up together. Um, and, and I can remember back in high school, I was a member of the ISCF group, the Inner School Christian Fellowship Paul was kind of a sarcastic, he could be very rude, he would mock me and my friends who sometimes would gather around the locker. Well, fast forward to years later, I was involved in running a Christian coffee house in Toronto, and we'd get hundreds of young adults coming in, and that night, one particular night, who walks in but my former locker partner, his name was Paul. And what a greeting I gave to Paul. I said, Paul, what are you doing here? And Paul very quickly shared his testimony. Now, I need to tell you, what an exciting conversion. And there were a lot of factors way beyond me. But he did take the, the, the time to say, John, I still remember back in high school, making jokes, kidding you guys, mocking you guys, but you, you stood firm. You, you didn't give in. You, you, you were still nice but you're bold, you're courageous. And, and in Paul's words, he said, it, it convicted me. 
I realized you guys had something I don't have. I realized that uh, my destiny was not good. And I think that's kind of what Paul has in mind here. It's, it's a sign. It's a message to those who would oppose us, who would be uh, our bullies when it comes to uh, our Christian faith. But did you also notice there's a dual sign? It's not only uh, a sign to those who oppose us, but it's a sign to us of our salvation. Now, remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that word satiria can be translated in different ways. I, I think here it has more to do with, it, it's a sign of assurance, of, of God's vindication, of his approval of us. And I don't know about you, but any time that I've taken a stand for Christ and I've spoken out for him, I find that tremendous sense of assurance comes over me. And when we discover that through the Spirit we have a, a boldness and a courage to stand up in face of opposition, that is a real blessing to us. So don't miss these signs. Don't overlook them. But I want to conclude with this idea of suffering. And, and it is what do we say? Like, it's one of those wow statements here in verse 29. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but to suffer for him as well. Suffering? Some of us are saying, okay, we're coming to the end of Philippians chapter 1, this series on irresistible joy. What a letdown for Paul to talk about suffering. And yet it's worse than that. Paul says that it's been granted to us, which means it, it's been gifted to us. It's part of God's grace. Now, it, it, it's got a lot of theological implications when Paul says it's been granted to you to believe. It teaches us that believing in Christ is not just a self-effort, but it, it's a gifting from God. Think of uh, Ephesians 2, where Paul says it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. Even the faith is ultimately a gift from God. So that's a wonderful truth. But Paul says even more, not only granted to you to believe, but also to suffer for him. It's part of the package. Hey, at Christmas, I uh, received a sweater. A very nice sweater, but the uh, labels on the sweater said one size. The tag on the collar said another size. And the tag on the collar was the right size and, and not a, a good fit for me. The problem, I don't have the gift receipt. And someone with good intentions removed the label. So now I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I'm left with a sweater in my closet that really doesn't fit. But who knows, maybe it should fit. But here we see, with this notion of a gift receipt, God has gifted us with a gift where there's no gift receipt. It's not like someone who says to you, oh, I've left the gift receipt in the box. If, if you don't like the color, if it doesn't fit, just return it. That's not an option for us. This is part of the package, part of God's intention for us. Now, this passage could apply to suffering in general, and... Uh, we know that people suffer because of health difficulties, trials or challenges in life. I think of James 1 that tells us God has a purpose in why he allows or uh, permits uh, suffering in your life. But I think in a particular way, in this context, the suffering is the suffering that we endure because we're taking a stand. We're standing up for Christ and speaking out for him. Now, if you look at the situation for the Philippians and what was about to happen to them, it sure would seem to be far worse than us. If you look at the persecuted church today, uh, you look at what's going on in the rest of the world and you look at what was, is going on in Canada, it's, it's hard to think it's as relevant for us. But maybe this passage is a bit prophetic. Cancel culture is a reality in 2021. Opposition against Christianity is increasing. 
you notice it. I've observed it. So we need to take this kind of passage to heart. We need to be willing not only to accept that gift that enables us to believe in Christ, but are you willing to stand up for Christ, to stand up to those bullies even when it might hurt? Now, just a caution. I've seen people use this passage as support for their rudeness and their being obnoxious, supposedly for the sake of Christ. Sometimes there are Christians who suffer because they're just plain weird. And, uh, you know, you kind of pull back and go, you know, really, don't pretend that you're suffering for the sake of Christ or for the, the gospel. You're, you're suffering because uh, you're, you're, you're just being crazy. You, you've got some ideas and theories that are proving you're a nut bar, not you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, so that's a caution. Um, and in fact, I think it's important for us to take the first part of verse 27 and keep that in mind when we look at the suffering we endure. Um, if we're suffering for the sake of Christ and speaking out for the gospel and the essentials of our faith, that's one thing. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't suffer because we're hypocritical or we're inconsistent or we're just being plain crazy. Um, Paul finishes by saying, I just want you to know that the struggle that you might be going through is, is a struggle I can identify. Paul knew what we, he was talking about. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but when I gave a couple of scenarios earlier, the one about praying at a family reunion, uh, I was describing a situation that I was in. And I can tell you it was difficult. It was hard. Um, we all like to be liked, and uh, I had to stand up for Christ and pray, and pray in Jesus' name, and, and yet I know that that was offensive to some people. And you've had those kinds of conversations, as I've had, about some of these controversial topics. And there's times where I've had to say to a person, I respect your opinion, but truth is truth. You could believe that 2 plus 2 is 5 and be very sincere about it, but it doesn't believe it's true. So I've been in that position, and you may find yourself in that position as well. So stand up for the truth. Stand up for the faith of the gospel. Stand up for Jesus. Let's stand together. Let's stand firm. Let's stand tall. Let's strive together in the face of opposition. For as we stand up for Christ, we need to stand up to those who are bullies. And, and we have special weapons, don't we? Our weapons are not retaliation and revenge. You're out for me, I'll be out for you. We have powerful weapons like love and like prayer. I said a few weeks ago, Jesus said, some say, love your friends, hate your enemies. I say, love your friends, pray for your enemies. And we need to pray for those. We need to love with that kind of love that comes from our irresistible joy. We need to love others into this heavenly kingdom so they too can be citizens of the everlasting kingdom. Two songs that I love. The old hymn, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Today will you stand up for Jesus. The other song is a song by Keith Green years ago. It was from an album that he called No Compromise. If you have a chance to see the cover of that album, and you may want to Google it, what you will see is a depiction of Daniel's friends. You remember the story? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the people of Babylon uh, were to bow down before the king, but they refused to bow down. And in this portrait on the album cover, you see 
these three young men standing up for truth, standing up for their God, refusing to bow down. This album called No Compromise. We need men and women like you and me who will stand up for what we believe, who will stand up to those who are bullies, and all for the glory and the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for these four verses at the end of Philippians chapter 1. I ask God that you will take them and use them and apply it to our hearts as we have opportunities to stand up for what we believe. Oh God, would we be faithful. We really want to be good citizens of our heavenly kingdom, to represent our Lord Jesus Christ, to be his ambassadors here on earth. And Father, the reality is that there's a lot of opposition. There's a lot of hostility in our world today. Oh God, help us to stand up to those bullies and not to be frightened, not to be scared off, but to stand up, but to do so with love and a passion for those who are lost. Oh, Father, I pray that you will help us apply this message and that it will be a blessing not only to us, but those around us. Father, I pray for our church. I pray, God, that you will continue to bless us. I pray, Father, that you will be with those who uh, are going through difficulties or trials at this time. I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you will continue to supply our practical needs that we will be able to fulfill our obligations. And, oh God, we pray for this pandemic. We so look forward to that day and hopefully very soon where we will be able to come together again in person. Father, when I think of bowing down and standing up, I think of a passage we're going to be looking at soon where we are told that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. But Jesus, in the meantime, oh Lord, help us as we strive together to stand up for you. For it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.